Hello, loyal followers. This is Sherry Shabowski, and today we're going to talk about the endocrine glands versus the exocrine glands. The photo has nothing to do with the discussion, except that I was writing this lecture while on a trip to Portugal. Let's start with what is a gland? All glands are made of specialized epithelium, organized and maintained by connective tissue. All glands synthesize and secrete a product that the body needs. The main difference between the two is the delivery system for the products. There are three types of glands, exocrine, endocrine, and mixed, or both. Let's start with the exocrine glands. Exocrine glands deliver essential substances that the cells synthesize and secrete directly onto body surfaces, like the skin or body cavities. These include things like tears, saliva, sweat or sebum, stomach enzymes, breast milk, bile, pancreatic fluids and enzymes, and intense intestinal mucus. This is the most basic structure of an exocrine gland. There are acinar cells that make the essential substances and transfer them into the ductal system that is lined with cuboidal epithelial cells that ultimately send the product onto the surface. The grouping of cells that make the substances and send them into the ducts are called an acinus. The substances that are made within the acinar or secretory cells are released in several different ways. Mirocrine secretions is basically exocytosis. Products are packaged into vesicles that adhere to the cell membrane and then release their product into the ductal system. The pancreatic digestive enzymes are released by this mirocrine secretion. That's a good example. Apocrine secretion is often referred to as the decapitation method. Basically, the tops of the cells containing the secretions are pinched off and sent out into the ductal system, like a decapitation. These secretions are usually cloudy and proteinaceous. Breast milk is a really good example. Holocrine secretions represent programmed cell death. The entire cell gets loaded up with the product and then ruptures and disintegrates and becomes the secretion. A good example of holocrine secretion is the sebum of the scalp and sebaceous glands of the skin. If you've ever seen a sebaceous cyst with all the gross particulate matter inside, it's easy to guess that these secretions represent the disintegration of whole cells or holocrine secretions. The exocrine gland is typically made of many, many, many acini arranged in lobules that are surrounded by myoepithelial cells, which push the substances forward into the ductal system. The ducts appear something like a tree where the acini are the leaves and the smallest branches are the intralobular ducts which branch off of the interlobular ducts that branch off the main duct which is the trunk. Just like tree branches and leaves are arranged in many different sizes and shapes, this also happens in the glands. Here we have another view showing how the secretions go onto the surface. The acini of the glands come in many different shapes and sizes, but they all move important substances from their origin cells through larger and larger ducts, ultimately secreting them onto the surface. Just like tree branches and leaves are arranged in many different shapes and sizes, so are the endocrine glands. To support the analogy, I have showed them here like a group of trees, but the analogy only goes so far. Unlike trees that absorb water and nutrients from the base and transport them to the leaves, 
glands make the substances what would be the corollary of the leaves and transport it toward the base for distribution. And they are obviously much smaller than trees. In fact, a bonsai tree would look like a redwood when compared to a gland. Moving on to the endocrine glands. While exocrine glands distribute their products through a ductal system to a surface, the endocrine system makes substances or hormones in this case, and then transfers the hormones by way of the bloodstream. So the endocrine glands are always adjacent to capillary beds and blood vessels. Endocrine signaling is a type of cell communication. Cells need to communicate with each other. Cellular communication takes many forms. Maybe the most unusual is the first one, which is called autocrine chemical signaling, such as that in the adaptive immune system. The cell literally signals itself. Cells that are adjacent may communicate via gap junctions between the cells. Cells that are neighbors may send their chemicals through space between the cells. This is a short distance. Endocrine signaling, which is what we're talking about here, sends their chemical signals or hormones through the bloodstream, often to very remote target cells in the body. There are many endocrine glands in the body. The endocrine system controls and regulates bodily functions. The glands include the pineal gland, the hypothalamus, or at least part of it, the pituitary gland, the parathyroid, the thyroid, the thymus, the adrenal gland, the pancreas, the kidneys, testes, and ovaries. The thyroid gland is a classic example of an endocrine gland with some special features. The specialized epithelial cells make the thyroglobulin, and then that's stored in colloid pools within the gland. That would be the pink in my picture there. Once iodine is attached to the thyroglobulin in that colloid pool, it'll move back into the epithelial cell where it is modified and enters the bloodstream as T3 and T4, which are the hormones that come from the thyroid. Some glands are mixed endocrine and exocrine glands within the same organ. These are called mixed glands. The pancreas is a classic example. The exocrine component sends bicarbonate and digestive enzymes through the ductal system into the small intestine. The endocrine component is responsible for sugar regulation in the blood. When the blood sugar is high, insulin is released. When it is low, glucagon is released. You can see the glucagon regulation video that's already posted on YouTube and Facebook on my site for more details on this process. These hormones are released into the blood. Insulin acts on all your cells to open the door for glucose to come in. Glucagon acts on your liver to break down alternative substances to make glucose or to generate new glucose molecules. In this picture of the pancreas, the yellow represents the exocrine component, seen up close in the next slide. Notice the ducts, which must be present in the endocrine portion. The more colorful areas are the islets of Langerhans, which are the endocrine component, including beta cells that make insulin, alpha cells that make glucagon, and delta cells that make somatostatin. Notice that blood vessels are in proximity to the endocrine component, as it must be. This is an up close of the enzymes and bicarbonate that is made in the endocrine component of the pancreas, where the products are released by miracrine secretion, or exocytosis. How many mixed endocrine exocrine glands are there? Well, the liver produces and secretes bile and also gives growth hormone, accepts growth hormone, and gives growth hormone into the blood. 
the testes produces sperm, which is considered a miracrine exocrine function. It is also producing testosterone. The ovaries produce eggs, and eggs are released into a duct. This represents its endocrine function. Excuse me, its exocrine function. The endocrine function is the release of progesterone and estrogen. Thank you for learning with me. If you like these videos, please like and subscribe to the Medical Education in Minutes Facebook page. And please subscribe to my YouTube page as well. This is free content for everyone, so I'd really appreciate it if you checked it out. A little encouragement could really go a long way to keep me posting videos. I mean, I recently retired from clinical medicine, but I have always loved teaching. So as long as there is interest, I'll continue, even in Porto, which is in the picture. Also, please consider the courses at www.medicaleducationinminutes.com. They cost a lot less than textbooks, and although not as detailed, I believe they will provide you with a great knowledge base that you will remember and be able to build upon. And to be fair, how many textbooks have you bought that you never actually took advantage of, right? I think it's worth it. All right, I'll see you next time.